Many years ago, I was invited to join a swing revival big band, and man, I was really humbled by the experience. I struggled a lot to keep up with them for quite a long time. I want to share some of the things I learned along the way so someone smart like you can pick it up way faster than I did. The early 90s introduced a swing revival, which brought back the music from the 1930s and 1940s and made it mainstream in popular culture again. I was in middle school at the time, and I was really focused on learning how to play boogie-woogie piano. I thought that would make the girls love me. But turns out the girls actually liked the underground punk rock scene a whole lot more, and that just wasn't my jam. But all that changed when I discovered a new band, Big Bad Voodoo Daddy. As I moved along, my high school jazz band was playing big band charts by Benny Goodman and Glenn Miller. I started to realize that the sound of Big Bad Voodoo Daddy that I loved so much was inspired by this music from Benny Goodman and Louis Prima and Cab Galloway. I spent countless hours trying to understand how Big Bad Voodoo Daddy's music worked. I remember this one scene where they were playing on a late night show, The Tonight Show or something like that, and the camera swooped over the piano player. His name was Josh, by the way. We must come from good stock. But the camera swooped over, and for a brief moment, I could see what his hands were doing. When I finally got it paused at just the right point, I could see he was playing these four notes. A flat, D, G, C. And I was like, what is this chord? This does not look like any chord that I've ever heard before. So I bought the book of sheet music and I flipped to exactly the part of the song that I was interested in and it says B flat seven. I remember thinking to myself, how can this be a B flat seven chord? There's no B flat in it, it doesn't make any sense. And that was when I realized that the piano player Josh didn't have to play B flat because his buddy Dirk, who's standing behind him with an upright bass was playing the B flat and there was no need for both of them to play the same note. And I felt like I had just discovered something that only the professionals knew. Like I had been invited to this secret jazz piano society and I was so excited to be a part of it. So anyway, here I am way out of music school and I'm invited to join this big band. And this band is playing some of the old tunes that I love from my childhood. And I was just so ecstatic to be invited to be part of it. But I wasn't nearly as well prepared to play with this band as I thought I was. And so here are nine different things that I wish I knew when I started playing with a big band. And if you stick around to the end, I will show you two of my favorite chord voicings for playing in this style. Tip number one, know your band. It's imperative that we understand the makeup of our own group. Most jazz bands have five saxophones, four trumpets, four trombones, and a rhythm section. As the piano player, right, we're a part of the rhythm section. In some cases, the bands may have additional instruments. That might be the makeup of the band overall, like in the Benny Goodman big band, which had a clarinet player, Benny Goodman. But you also might just bring in a specific instrument for a specific tune. It's, it's pretty common to have a mallet player, like a vibraphone. Sometimes you might have something like a jazz violin, but eh, eh. Jazz violinists tend to be divas. Anyway, the way that you play in the band is going to depend greatly based on who else in the band is playing at that moment. You need to be aware of what sections are playing so that you know how to best fit in. Tip number two, know the arrangement. Big band music is a lot more prescribed than you might find in a smaller ensemble like a trio or, or a quartet. When you're playing with a smaller group, you can really embrace spontaneity. You can feed off of each other's energy and kind of go where the moment takes you. And this might mean you reharmonize things or change styles or change tempos and you guys can all feed off of each other. Big band music though is much more arranged. There's a hard and fast structure to the song. The horn parts are written out note for note. We know exactly who's gonna solo and at what point. And well, they may not admit to it, but a lot of the solo sections are written out ahead of time, note for note too. The beginnings and the ends of the tunes are all written out. We know exactly how we're gonna play them. In fact, the band leader leads us through rehearsals so that he gets exactly the sound that he wants out of that tune. This is quite different than playing with a trio, where the same players playing the same song would never play it the same way twice. Tip number three, play the chords that are called for. Because the big band chart is arranged so specifically and all the horn lines are written out note for note, we do not have any freedom at all to change what chords we want to play. Again, in a smaller group where we're largely responsible for the harmonic direction of the song, we have a lot more freedom to determine what chords we want to play. If we want to flat the nine or flat the 13, we have the freedom to do that. But when playing with the big band, if we sharp the nine, but the horn lines call for a natural nine, it's no good. So you need to approach your practice for big band differently than you would in a trio. You need to really figure out specifically what voicings to play at what specific moment and make sure that they follow the chart perfectly. Tip number four, stay off the bottom of the piano. Unless it's your turn to solo, there's absolutely no reason for you to be playing in this low end part of the piano. 
The bass player who's standing next to you, who's probably playing with an amplifier, this is his domain. Don't intrude on it. And that's not to mention the berry sax and the lower trombones who are also playing in this register. This is not your job. Stay away from this part of the piano. Tip number five, play in the right registers and at the right time. So while we're not playing down here on the bottom, there's plenty of room for us to play up on the top. But we have to be a little careful because the alto saxes and the trumpets are playing up in this area and we don't want to clash with them either. Oftentimes, while the top end is being covered by all those other instruments, we may decide to play very little. When there's a gap between the phrases, that's our time to shine. We can put in a little fill, put in a little chord, make sure we don't step on the horns. Tip number six, know your role and when to step back. In some big bands, the rhythm section can get pretty large. We're obviously going to have a drummer and a bass player, and we're going to have some kind of chording comping instrument like a piano. We may also have a guitar. Sometimes you might have a vibraphone. I even played with an accordion once. So I would suggest you sit down with a guitar player ahead of time. You figure out who's going to play what section of each tune and give yourself some signals that you can use to make some decisions on the fly. Tip number seven, be the rhythm section. When we play with a small group, we may be the only person outlining the harmony. Laying down the chords of the tune is a big part of our job, but that's much less important for us in the big band. We have 12 to 15 other musicians in the band who are playing arranged horn lines, and trust me, those guys are covering the harmony well enough already. Remember, we're the rhythm section. It's definitely important we play all the right notes, but that's not our main job. Our main job is to lay down the groove. The drums, the bass, the piano, the guitar, our job is to make sure that there's a rhythmic foundation beneath all of the horn parts. So when we practice, it's really easy to get caught up on studying the voicings to make sure that we play the right notes. And of course you should do that, but don't lose sight of how important it is to practice rhythms. We want to be precise and intentional with the rhythms that we're playing. Tip number eight, follow rhythmic cues. So like I said earlier, big band charts are written out note for note, but that's not really true for us as piano players. We're gonna get something that looks much more like a lead sheet that shows us which chords that we should be playing. But these charts also include clues as to what the rest of the band is playing so that you know how to play around them. And oftentimes you will see specific rhythmic figures called out for you to play. That usually means you're gonna play some rhythmic unison line with the rest of the band. This is not a time for you to improvise or make up your own rhythm. This is the time for you to play exactly what the chart says, to play it note for note exactly as it's written. Tip number nine, comp behind the solos. During the solo sections, our job as a piano player changes entirely, because with most of the band sitting out quiet, we're essentially a small group again. So this is kind of like going back to playing with a small group, where we have some freedom to improvise and comp behind the soloist. We want to follow the energy and the direction that the soloist is giving us and provide a good background for them. In these moments, we can feed off of their energy and create something spontaneous in the moment. We can have some fun here. At the same time, it's really common for there to be arranged horn lines that are going to come in during the solos. These might be as simple as just chord stabs that have been arranged in the band, or they might be whole melodic ideas that are used to transition you from one idea to the next. While you're free and you're comping, you gotta make sure that you understand when those moments are gonna happen and how to be a part of them. I promise you if you made it this far that I was gonna give you my favorite two hand chord voicings for playing with the big band. When we play with the big band, there's nothing wrong with our traditional chord voicings. We can totally play our normal shells, our three note voicings, our rootless voicings. They work great, especially when we're comping behind solos. But those voicings live kind of here in the middle range of the piano, and that's a pretty crowded space. It's played by every instrument in the band. So here's the first voicing I use, and I use it 95% of the time. In your left hand, we're gonna play a three and a seven. In our right hand, we're gonna play five and one, and I like to double it up in an octave, so like five, one, five. I like to think of this as like a power chord if you're playing hard rock. It's just the one and the five. So in this position, you can move your right hand up and down to play melodic ideas, either to play in unison with the band or to create some kind of a counter melody. So as you experiment with this, take note that when you move the one and the five up a whole step, you get the nine and the 13. So this is a really easy way for you to get off the roots and play some more colorful notes. So make sure you practice all the inversions of these also. We've been playing three and seven in our left hand, but make sure you can reverse those and play seven on the bottom and three on top. The same thing goes with our right hand. We've been playing five, one, five, but make sure you can also do one, five, one. Being fluid in these inversions is gonna give you a lot of freedom to move around and have good voice leading. The second voicing I like to use is a little bit more advanced. They're called Mantooth voicings, and they're named after this dude, Frank Mantooth, who wrote this great book called Voicings for Jazz Keyboard. These voicings are a little bit unique in that we form them from the top down. Each of these voicings has five notes in them. So to make a C major chord, we're gonna start with the root on top, C major, 
and we're gonna come down to perfect fourth and add G, and we're gonna come down to perfect fourth and add D. And these are the notes I play in my right hand. Below that, we're gonna add another perfect fourth in our left hand, that's A, and beneath that, we're gonna put another perfect fourth, which is E. All perfect fourths. To get minor or half diminished or dominant chords, the easiest thing to do here is just move the note that's closest to the right place. So in the case of our C major chord here, if we're gonna play a C dominant seven, we're gonna take our A and we're gonna move it up to B flat. If we wanna play C minor, we're gonna do the same thing to the E and we're gonna move it down to E flat. So while these are called chordal voicings, they're not always literally perfect fourths, but they come from the major chords which are formed by perfect fourths. And once we kind of got this down, we need to learn a second variation of it, which works exactly the same way, but we just change what note we start on. So instead of starting on the root, we start on the fifth. After that, everything's the same. We take five notes that are all stacked by perfect fourths, and that's our major chord. If we want to play dominant or minor, half diminished, you just move the notes to their closest place. I don't want to give away all of Frank's hard work. You totally should buy this book. There's a whole lot more in here than what I just told you about. There's a link down in the description you can use to buy this book. If you buy it from there, the price is the same, but I get a little bit of a kickback. So it's a two for one. You learn how to play some jazz and you help support my hard work here on this channel. Now, before you run off to your piano to woodshed this, you should watch this other video I put together for you on spicy dominant seven chords that every jazz piano player needs to know.